Thank you again, and let me say good morning to colleague parliamentarians. First, let me acknowledge today's celebration of St. Cecilia Musical Day, and I wish to acknowledge the many children in our early childhood centers in Castries office. I didn't wait for St. Cecilia's Day, but the first, first action of mine after election was to um, use my constituency allocation and employ a retired, retired person from the police band to assign the responsibility to teach music, using musical bells to all early childhood centers in Castro's office. So I am pleased this morning that the children at early childhood centers in Castro's office, they are doing extremely well because they are being tutored by a professional mu musician using musical bells. And of course, I wish to congratulate them as they learn, as they move on, and I'm looking forward to Castries South is producing quite a number of musicians in future. Look out for them. Castries South is will take over the police band. <laughs> On a more sad note, I wish to express my deep sympathies um, for what took place this morning. I wouldn't say much to this. It's an emotional time for families, and anytime these things happen, it hits me to the core. Of course, what I can say, God knows best. But we'll continue to tarry and move on and do what we have to do. I rise to support this very important borrowing, Mr. Speaker. But of course, I would like to acknowledge the permanent secretary in the Ministry of Equity, Ms. Velda Joseph, who worked tirelessly, worked very, very hard, worked night, to put this proposal with the CDB together so today we can realize this thing before cabinet. A total of 5.2 million US dollars borrowing, almost 14 million dollars, 15 million EC dollars to the poor and vulnerable of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, it is well known that St. Lucia as a small island developing state existing within the context of climate change is highly vulnerable to multiple shocks or hazards. Some are natural, some are anthropogenic, man-made, and that its population, our people, are likely to be negatively impacted by those shocks on a frequent basis. It is also widely known that those most impacted and who encounter great difficulty in recovering or bouncing back are those with limited resources to cope with the consequences. And I speak of victims of landslides, victims of flooding, victims, fire victims, hurricanes, victims of domestic violence, orphans, persons living with disabilities, rehabilitated inmates, the poor living with HIV, abundant elderly and older persons, the retired poor, and marginalized groups. But if we have to pause, Mr. Speaker, and review our national statistics as it relates to the poor and vulnerable, we will recognize that a significant percentage of our population is deemed poor. And according to the Survey of Living Condition and Household Budgetary Survey of 2016, it was deemed that 25% are persons below the poverty line and with significant percentage that are vulnerable to poverty. How then do we treat our brothers and sisters who are not able to adequately provide for themselves and their families? How do we assist them so that they are able to enjoy a decent standard of living? How do we assist them in building resilience to cope with and respond to shocks? Should we discard them? Should we say, as some of us say in Creole, manya ufe kabanu se manya udomi, sa ufe sa Should it be what we say to our people in times like this? Mr. Speaker, colleague parliamentarians, I want to draw your attention to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a declaration which St. Lucia has signed on to, and to highlight Article 25.1, which states, Everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself or herself and for his or her family, including food, clothing, 
housing and medical care, and the necessary social services and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond the control. And I wish to also add, coming from our cabinet, the right to education. Because we in this cabinet believe, and we borrow from our Jamaicans people, that every child can learn and every child must learn. So Mr. Speaker, this article not only captures the philosophy of the government of St. Lucia in ensuring that we put people first and that our national development program is inclusive, but it also appropriately encapsulates the rationale behind this bill as well as the design of the project we have titled correctly Safety Nets for Vulnerable Population Affected by Coronavirus. Mr. Speaker, whether persons accept it, accept it or not, inequalities exist in our society. Discrimination exists. And we, and we have the knowledge that there are families who, for whatever reason, are unable to meet the basic needs and enjoy the right of a standard, of a decent standard of living. Mr. Speaker, at the Ministry of Equity, we see such families, we interact with head of such households, and we understand the need to assist them until they are able to manage independently. Mr. Speaker, we understand that the poor and vulnerable families need assistance and support, and that they require protection particularly given our current context where we are confronted by the prolonged negative impact of COVID-19. We strongly believe that we should not allow the less fortunate brothers and sisters among us to fall through the cracks, unable to meet their basic needs, and while we stand aside and do nothing. Mr. Speaker, I want to be very clear. Social protection is not a matter of charity or generosity. It is a basic responsibility of the state and one that we take seriously. It is the right thing to do in recognizing the rights of all St. Lucians to a basic standard of living. And it is on that basis that the government will, through my ministry, spend no effort in providing appropriate support to those in need and will aggressively seek out and utilize new and existing social protection services to help individuals and families cope with crises and shocks, improve, improve livelihoods opportunities, invest in human capacity, and protect the aging population as we advance our national development agenda. Mr. Speaker, it is not often that we come to this house to borrow people and direct investment in people. We usually run the tables when we borrow for roads and infrastructure. We can relate to hotels that will bring in income. But this government, this administration, understand that when we invest in people, we invest in our future. Mr. Speaker, the recent rains would have proven that asphalt will not last even after you've spent millions to resurface the roads when dealing with floods, with floods like ours. Buildings will not survive after the winds would have blown the roofs from hurricanes and we have no insurance to recover. But when we invest in our people, our people, the lowest among us, I can assure you, Mr. Speaker, we have invested in the future of St. Lucia. Mr. Speaker, although these interventions speak directly to persons impacted by coronavirus, I will not elaborate on the negative impacts of COVID-19, particularly on the poor and vulnerable individuals and families, as I believe that there is familiarity with this issue. Rather, Mr. Speaker, for full understanding of what we are seeking to do, permit me to speak a little on social protection and how social protection systems can be effectively leveraged to support families in need. Mr. Speaker, as noted by the World Bank, social protection systems that are well-designed are powerful as they enhance human, human capital and productivity, reduce inequalities, build resilience, and end the intergenerational cycle of poverty. Such systems and tools are transformative 
as they help mitigate economic and fiscal shocks. Mr. Speaker, the inequalities among us will not go away if we do not purposefully and directly address the social and economic challenges which confronts us, but particularly at this time, especially following the brutal effects of COVID-19 pandemic and the adverse impacts of the Russia-Ukraine war on St. Lucia and the wider Caribbean region. This project, therefore, is intended to serve as a direct response to our socioeconomic realities, providing social assistance or temporary relief to targeted individuals and households who, ne who were negatively impacted by the cor coronavirus pandemic and who have not been able to recover or whose situation have worsened. Mr. Speaker, and just as I speak of those who have not recovered, Mr. Speaker, I'm not just speaking as a parliamentarian who have sat behind a desk. Over the years, I've taken interest, even when the ministry has not called for it, or when SSD have didn't call for it. I would call the fire service and ask them about fire victims. Mr. Speaker, you would be surprised that there are data at the fire service of the many fires we have had and persons who have not recovered because of the socioeconomic situation. Mr. Speaker, you can choose to call the fire service chief and ask them to provide you with the numbers and you may be alarmed of the hundreds of persons. Mr. Speaker, I happened to visit a lady recently whose home still had the mark of mud from Thomas. The flooding which took place, she has not recovered. Mr. Speaker, when we speak of persons vulnerable, we are talking about persons who can hardly ever recover when, do, when they experience those shocks. The government is seeking to provide a safety net to those families or households to prevent them from falling deeper into poverty or from experiencing worsening conditions. Many of the com components that I will highlight is for a period of six months. And Mr. Speaker, upon assuming the responsibility, Minister of Equity, Social Justice and Empowerment, the largest cash transfer of this country is the public assistance program. Mr. Speaker, I have respected this program to a T. And every, I, while I represent the second largest constituency, and of course with vulnerable persons, I haven't taken one person from my constituency and unilaterally asked the ministry to put them on. Because there's a system for persons to be assessed, and I respect the 3.0 SL net. If you are not qualified, you ought not to be on it. And that's why I support the Prime Minister. We are not doing things in terms of just parliamentarians. You would, if you look at the data, which I've seen, it happened that the largest, no, the, the greatest number of persons being served under the SLNet is from Sufra. I'm sure the minister is not aware, but I will, I will share with her the details. I have looked at the data set. Not Castry Southeast. Ancillary Canaries also is well served there. Not grossly, but I'm saying that it is being done objectively. Some time ago, some persons just put persons on PAP. And today, Mr. Speaker, the public assistance, we are cleaning it. Because while it's costing this government over $20 million annually to maintain a total of 3,600 persons, we are now seeking ways to look at pathways to graduate people out of this. But there's 1,500 persons who are waiting to come on. And those persons were certified and qualified by the, by the tool being used, by SLNet 3.0. We cannot get them on because there's no fiscal space. But in this difficult COVID time, do we allow them to languish? No. This government saying, let us borrow. So we give them six months of relief while we take care of seeing how we graduate persons so we get a permanent solution to public assistance. I commend the Prime Minister for doing this. 
Mr. Speaker. In keeping with what I said earlier, safety nets for vulnerable population affected by coronavirus. This project aims to contribute to ensuring a minimum level of quality of life for vulnerable persons amidst the crisis caused by COVID-19, as well as preserving human capital. The project consists of four main components. One, protection using existing cash transfers. Like I said, protection for vulnerable population, not on the roster for transfer programs, working in informal sector, support for, learn, for continuing, for continuity in, um, for learning continuity in vulnerable groups, and the project administration and management. Mr. Speaker, let's examine these in a little more details. Component one, protection using the existing cash transfer programs. Like I said, it's going to cost us 766,000 US. Mr. Speaker, our public assistance, the largest cash transfer program, of course, is under tremendous pressure. And, of, and I, like I have explained it, we are going to support 800 persons on the list because when this was prepared, there were 800 persons waiting to get on. By the time we completed this, it came to 1,500. So the pressure continues to build because persons are going to the welfare department, they are being processed, and if they are eligible, they are put on the waiting list. It is sad that some people who are struggling struggling, cannot find room to receive the $300, and we just do not want to, without being objective, just remove somebody because they do not look like. So we are working, and we have started, Mr. Speaker. Recently there, Lucilla gave us $450,000. One of the pathways that we have agreed in getting people away from public assistance is microenterprise. And that is why we had 35 persons who are on public assistance who have been deemed to qualify or to, to graduate from, public, from, from this public assistance have embarked on a micro-enterprise program so that they could open their small business. So we're not just removing them. We are empowering them so that they can maintain proper a, standard, a, a good standard of living. And Madam Commerce, Madam Commerce, I'm really happy that you are providing support in that regard. Mr. Speaker, for households on the waiting list, for almost two years, waiting. And I think sometimes of those persons who are waiting in anguish, and I ask my, myself, are they waiting for someone to, to pass? Because one way people get out of the, of the program when they pass, somebody else gets on, you know. And these are poor, struggling, vulnerable persons. So yes, Minister, member for Strozel, of course, Strozel will be part of it because we, we do not hold any doctrine that excludes. We believe in including everyone. Mr. Speaker, the horizontal expansion of the public assistance program at a cost of 666,000 this subcomponent will support a horizontal expansion to finance temporary cash transfers to the 800 persons. And of course, under the program, we are going to support them for six months. The vertical expansion of the child disability grant. Mr. Speaker, this one is a really one of the saddest experience in terms of social development, persons living with disability. Mr. Speaker, I have spoken about this in cabinet. I've, I, I, I asked PM to allow me to visit some other jurisdiction, and I went to Jamaica to Mustard Seeds, where I, I witnessed you know, a priest with a vision managing 174 persons with disability. And I'm talking about chronic disabilities. And as I speak there, I'm sure Tia, who is just 10 years old from Lapua, would understand why I will mention a name. Tia is receiving $200 a month. Mom is quite young. Tia goes to the Donata school. Tia, along with two other students like her, is being, is, must attend school only three days a week. Three days a week. And must be managed by two teachers because of her disability. 
I do not, when I went to CT, I was not happy with the conditions that T was living in. But her disability was striking I, as the, the normal person watching somebody who is mentally, physically, must be on your back always, you would almost dismiss that this person really do not know what's going on. When I went to the Donata school, Mr. Speaker, I was told by the teacher that Tia is a bright child. And she can experience hurt as well as laughter. She, she doesn't respond in the way that we respond, but she knows. And I said, oh my God, how many times persons may have said things that she's aware and she's hurt. Think of it. And to what extent we have dismissed that these people cannot learn. Whereas they told me that she's bright. And I told Prime Minister there was a young man on a wheelchair who said, I want to see the Prime Minister. And he was happy to see me at the Donata School. Mr. Speaker, we are going to increase this $200 to $400 for the next six months. This is what we're going to do. We're going to increase the contribution so that Tia gets more. That's what we're going to do. And I've already lobbied with the Taiwanese ambassador through Prime Minister to see if I can get a vehicle for persons going to children attending the Donata school because I would like for these children to attend school because every child can learn and every child must learn. The vertical expansion for persons living with HIV is part of this program. A total of $19,000, of course, and I'm talking about poor individuals who are almost disregarded, dismissed. You know, in St. Lucia, Lania, Le Cossidi, Wey, Munka Gado, Cossidi, Opani Valet, Uvin Telma Ba, Pearson Pamele. Not with this government. We're going to increase the food vouchers. And of course, the $100 will be increased by $200 for the next six months. Mr. Speaker, also, we're going to take care of those in foster care programs. A total of $34,000 will be invested to increase the contribution to foster care from three to $400 for the next six months. Mr. Speaker, I must inform this honorable house that cash transfers are very important to social protection programs and have a multiplier effect on the local economy. Cash can stimulate recovery by creating short-term employment flows, increasing consumer purchasing power, and support trade, rebuild marketing linkages. And for those of us who are the purists on, on, on this economic system that you must invest, invest, we're saying that when you invest in the people, it also have a multiplier effect on the economy. Now, Mr. Speaker, I turn to component two for the vulnerable population, not on the rosters for transfer programs, working in the informal sector. A total of US 3.1, 3.2 million dollars will be invested. And this component has three subcomponents. Income support for cash transfers to displace informal sector workers, and that includes transfers we're going to support persons who are somewhere on the, on the near our visitors in arts and craft, dry goods vendors, tour guides, cruise personnel, and taxi operators. This support will follow a cycle of cash transfers valued at $500 per month for three months. We will support these individuals. Detail, we are working on the details as to what would qualify for this. And this would be received by cabinet for the approval. But we will be supporting this. A sub, another subcomponent of 1.1 million. The government of St. Lucia will provide a provided, oh yes, we are reimbursing the government. Because some time ago, we provided support to bar owners and the taxi drivers. So a total of $1.2 million will be reimbursed in the consolidated fund for that action that we did. So that is coming back. And of course, Mr. Speaker, $18,000 will go towards feeding the homeless and indigent population. So persons who have been feeding individuals on the street, $18,000 will go and support this so that we ensure for the next six months, December until June, that we support these individuals. Mr. Speaker, component three focuses on support 
of learning continuity in vulnerable populations. A total of $1.2 million will be spent. Mr. Speaker, during the peak of COVID-19, the Ministry of Education was forced to employ virtual approaches for continued learning. During this process, several students, particularly from poor and vulnerable households, were disadvantaged, and they did not have access to the devices at all. Under this component, financing will facilitate the purchase of 133 devices for the Ministry of Equity to manage. BTC will receive the Transit Home, Upton Girls Center, the Rainbow Children's Home, in Viewfort, 108 devices for Viewfort and Denry. We will provide support in these areas. Mr. Speaker will also find five interactive screens to support technology enhance teaching and learning in classrooms that will be procured by the Ministry of Equity. Additionally, Mr. Speaker, 500 devices will be provided for learners in vulnerable households benefiting from PAP. So apart from providing devices to these institutions that are most times ignored, the Boys Training Center, Upton Girls Center, the Rainbow Homes, where we have our vulnerable people, we will provide devices to them so that they continue learning. Because again, we believe every child can learn. Every child must learn. Another subcomponent is minor works. We'll be looking at um, establishing a learning resource center at New Beginning Transit Home. We will support um, the air conditioning system, electrical fittings there as well. And the capacity building, a subcomponent, subcomponent will be providing 30 teachers across, the across various agencies from the Ministry of Equity. Um, we will be providing them with devices as well. Mr. Speaker, the final subcomponent of this program is the $1.5 million towards the managing of the entire program and um, providing support to some schools. Of course, we're looking at transportation, we're looking at nutrition, and of course, looking at the whole management of this program. Mr. Speaker, the project budget has been calculated at just a mere 5.2 million, and it will be financed through a soft loan, a concessionary, concessionary fin financing from special funds resources from the Caribbean Development Bank. Mr. Speaker, we are pleased that we'll be able to benefit this, benefit from this, and ensure that the people who we are concerned about, who are within the purview of this ministry, will find some support over the next six months. In summary, Mr. Speaker, the funds requesters will assist the government in fin financing this project, which will promote equitable cash transfers, as well as the expansion of our safety nets services using a platform of existing cash transfer programs and special transfers to persons directly affected by COVID. It will also support education continu continuity in St. Lucia, as well as vulnerable population working in the informal sector who are not part of the existing cash transfers arrangement. Mr. Speaker, this project supports the long-term vision of the government of St. Lucia as articulated in the revised National Social Protection Policy 2022 to 2030 which focuses on provision and fulfillment of the needs and rights of individuals, in particular at-risk children, the poor, the vulnerable, elderly, youth, men and women, families and communities, and the development of the full potential of, our, of citizens paying particular attention to the poorest and most vulnerable populations. For a comprehensive, integrated, and sustainable social protection system. Those needs and rights include the following. Basic income security in the form of various social transfers, such as pensions for the elderly, pensions with persons with disabilities, child benefits, income support benefit, skill development, employment guarantees and services for unemployed and underemployed. 
to available and affordable access to essential social services in areas of health, water and sanitation, education, food security, housing, welfare and other defined according to national priorities. Three, strengthening the resilience of the poor, vulnerable, and deprived individuals, groups, and communities facing economic, social, climatic, and health risks and shocks through enhanced adaptive social protection. Mr. Speaker, as we know, the government of St. Lucia has formulated and continues to implement policies and programs intended to result in socio-economic transformation and improve livelihoods for its citizens in keeping with its commitment to the 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda and the Medium Term Development Strategy 2021-26. The objective of this project is not different. It will complement ongoing initiatives aimed at putting people first. In addition to our NIC contributory social security, we have strengthened our social protection system and now stands on 10 pillars. The home care program administered through the SSDF which caters for approximately 500 persons. Educational assistance program, laptops payment, facilities fees, CXC's fees, school feeding program being administered through the Department of Education, food voucher programs for persons in need and many food and food related subsidies, non vacable food items for a public assistance program which currently caters for 3,006 100 beneficiary households which provide and support to include burial assistance, eye care, emergency housing, and medical assistance. The National Housing Assistance Program, the labor market activity to include short-term employment initiatives to include caretakers roadside cleaning by both the Ministry of Local Government and the Ministry of Infrastructure, stimulus caretakers program, seven, the micro entrepreneurship program, to function as one of a graduation pathway in collaboration with SSDF and Bell Fund. The foster care program, persons living with HIV program, providing assistance. And 10, we are now approaching universal health care. Please note that we are currently exploring unemployment insurance and social insurance as other pillars to support our social protection initiative. Mr. Speaker, this list is not exhaustive, nor was it intended to be. Rather, it provides a range of support services available to vulnerable households from which they can benefit based on needs. Mr. Speaker, parliamentarian colleagues, the safety net for vulnerable population affected by coronavirus also seeks to support vulnerable groups in need of assistance. Let us support investment in our less fortunate brothers and sisters by supporting this bill, which will pave the way for immediate rollout for these project components. As we move forward on the path of development, let us ensure that we leave no one behind. Single mothers, single fathers, members of the LGBTQ, the elderly, young men and women, young men and women in prison, abandoned children, those in foster care and in adoption services, the homeless, the mentally challenged, persons living with HIV, they all have rights and our social protection system ensures that no one should be excluded or discriminated against. In the song of the Holies of 1969, this, he says that he ain't heavy, he's my brother. They ain't heavy, they are our brothers and sisters. And in the Psalms of Psalms 19, 9 verse 18, it says, For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. I thank you.